right. Well, why don't you turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at the first 21 verses of that chapter. And um, uh, again, everything has been kind of preparatory leading up to this in a sense. We spent that first week doing all of the, uh, the background about Luke and his relationship with Paul, uh, probably how he got saved and some of the other things about him. Uh, and then we kind of keyed in then on, uh, on verse 8, which is certainly key to the outline of the book, and the book itself, where Jesus says, but the Holy Spirit shall come upon you, uh, and you shall be my witnesses both here in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. And we contrasted that with what Jesus taught about the Holy Spirit in John 14, where he said the Holy Spirit to his apostles uh, and disciples, the Holy Spirit is with you right then, but he will be in you. Uh, uh, and then, uh, of course, in John 20, uh, he breathes on them. They receive the Holy Spirit. We'd say that they were born again uh, uh, at that point. The same experience that all believers have when they come to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, but then, and, uh, in verse 8 of this chapter, he mentions uh, a distinct separate experience from that where the Holy Spirit would come upon them for the uh, express uh, purpose of empowering them to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. Uh, and we're about ready to, to see that happen here now, now in chapter 2. And, uh, and just because it, it, uh, this is one of those uh, passages of Scripture where there's a, a variety of viewpoints of what really has transpired uh, and what it means to us within, within the body of Christ. I feel like I, I've got to go on and just kind of set, set the table here a little bit. There is, uh, you know, on the back of our bulletin, there's always uh, some uh, uh, statements of, of our, our faith and what we believe in, what's important to us as Calvary Chapels. It makes us a little, a little distinctive uh, from other, other churches. And one of them, uh, it says the fact that we're, we're, we're non-denominational. We're not opposed to denominations as such, but only an overemphasis in certain doctrines that has had a tendency to divide the body of Christ. And we're going to hit one this morning. Uh, and so in this whole area of when the Holy Spirit is poured out, the results of what happens uh, is uh, one of them is they speak in a language they do not know. Uh, other people hear it being spoken in their language, and they're going to say, those guys are declaring the wonders of God, and by the way, how are they doing that? And they're kind of perplexed by it. Uh, and, uh, and there's a, a one side of, uh, of the body of Christ that uh, that uh, has a, a real focus on this area of spiritual gifts, Pentecostal charismatic side, and uh, and the way they view that will uh, will mention a few a few of those things. And of course, uh, it's spoken about here several other times in the Book of Acts. Paul in Corinthians writes extensively about it. It says that how these things uh, function, operate, and so forth. And all of that, for the most part, is absolutely ignored. Uh, the clear biblical teaching, instructions, and so forth by this group of people. And uh, I know from experience, because both my grandmothers are Pentecostal, and uh, I used to go to church with them a kid, as a kid, and it would scare me to death, because I had no idea what was going on. Somehow somebody would give a cue from up front, and everybody would uh, start uh, speaking in another language they didn't know loud. Uh, most of the people there, which Paul says, how about uh, at the most three? Uh, and only if someone's there to interpret. I'm pretty sure there were more three people in that church. Uh, you know, so you have this, because you have this misuse, non-biblical use, abuse uh, of, of, uh, of these gifts of the Spirit, uh, that one in particular, there's a whole other group of people over here, or methyl bacteria inside, that is saying, uh, that's all pretty crazy, so we're just going to go, uh, we're not doing that anymore. You know, and we'll say, we are cessationist, those things have ceased to end uh, at, uh, with the apostles and with the, uh, the book of Acts itself. Um, I can appreciate <laughs> this side, <laughs> having experienced uh, this, this side of things. Uh, and obviously, we've got brothers and sisters on both sides. Uh, what we try to do is what we try to do every week, what we call expositional teaching. We try the best we can just allow the text to, te to teach us to speak for itself without reading uh, anything else into it. And I, if I think if we do that correctly, we're, we're gonna have kind of a, a balance here, uh, which, uh, which means that uh, as, uh, as Calvary Chapel folks, these guys aren't really quite sure what to do with us because we believe some of the same things they do. And these guys over here are definitely not sure what to do with this because they're not sure which side of this fence we're on. 
And we're, we're not on offense. We're just trying to uh, teach the scriptures just the way that uh, they're laid out here before us. If that's uh, confuse you, maybe this will make more sense once we get in. But uh, it's kind of a, it can be a problem. It can be an issue. Uh, one of the things that's uh, kind of wonderful about, uh, about the church and because of our position on things like this is that uh, we have folks in the church that have come from a Pentecostal background and, and may speak in tongues. I'm not going to tell you who they are. You might scoot over. But, uh, uh, and, then, and then we've got the Methobacterian guys uh, over here. We're able to, uh, because we're going to focus uh, on the Word of God and see these things with what I believe is a balance. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, our text will minister to all of us in the importance of essential, uh, essential issue is we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater just because there's a segment of the body of Christ that uh, doesn't follow the clear teaching of Scripture when it comes to uh, spiritual gifts. Because as we said, our emphasis on the filling of the Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is the emphasis that Jesus gave so that you can be witnesses, uh, both here in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and so forth. Vance Havner, the uh, former uh, chaplain of the United States Senate, said, We will not move this world by criticism of it, nor conformity to it, but by the combustion within it of lives ignited by the Spirit of God. And that's, uh, that's really our aim, is that uh, we, our lives would be ignited uh, by God's Spirit. Well, let's jump into uh, the coming of the Spirit. We see that in the first 13 verses. Again, chapter 2, where it says, uh, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it, was, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat, each, uh, uh, sat upon each of them, uh, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Uh, and there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, from uh, every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Uh, then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes, Eliamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phygia Pam and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya, joining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, they are full of new wine. So uh, the first thing, the reason uh, for their being together is Pentecost. And <clears throat> it's kind of important just to talk about Pentecost and these feast days uh, for a moment. There are seven feast days that, that uh, the Judaism follows, uh, three of them that are required for males, if you can get there, to get to Jerusalem for these feast days. Pentecost was early June, best traveling time, biggest crowd, as opposed to fall for a uh, uh, feast of uh, Tabernacles or, or Passover, which uh, again, uh, earlier. Uh, in these feasts, some of them were held concurrently, and one of them is Passover. You have Passover, we're familiar with that uh, because of Jesus being the Passover lamb and so forth. With it, and we'll see, uh, especially in John's Gospel, those terms uh, interwoven with Feast of Unleavened Bread because it was held uh, at the same time concurrently. Also, with that, it concluded on a Sunday uh, with the Feast of uh, of first fruits. And Jesus fulfills all of those feasts. Jesus is the Passover lamb. Uh, the, uh, John the Baptist said, uh, there go the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In the same way that the Passover lamb was slain in Egypt, its blood was placed upon the, uh, the doorway of each uh, home and the angel of death passed over. In the same way, Jesus fulfills that by his blood being shed on the cross so that we no longer have to fear or experience death. We have eternal life in him. He is the atonement uh, for our sins. Unleavened bread. Again, unleavened bread. Remember when they had to leave Egypt suddenly because they could leave. They took the bread that they had. They wrapped it up and they took it with them. They did not have time for it to rise 
It was bread that was baked without yeast or without leaven. It was unleavened bread. That's what we call matzah. That's what we use for uh, when we have communion the first Sunday of every month. That's important because leaven or yeast is a, a symbol or a type of sin in the same way that yeast can get into a loaf of bread and it will permeate the entire loaf of bread. Therefore, the symbolism, sin can get in and it does permeate our, our entire lives. And so it's used that way as an example uh, many times uh, in the Old Testament. Therefore, Jesus fulfills the feast of unleavened bread because he had no leaven, no yeast, no sin. Paul says, he that had no sin became a sin offering for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Therefore, when we have communion and we're remembering Christ and what he's done for us, it's with the matzah, it's with the unleavened bread, what you might call a, a cracker, but that, that's bread. And, uh, and that's the reason we do it that way. You know, if you're in a church sometime, they got a couple of big French loaves up there and they're breaking them apart for communion. Well, I, I understand that, you know, they're trying to have communion. You go with what you got, but uh, it's kind of blowing the symbolism because you're seeing Jesus had sin in his life, you know, when he died on the cross for us. Unleavened bread. Jesus fulfills the feast of unleavened bread. Now, for us, uh, also very important is that as that time concluded, uh, then on Sunday, on Sunday morning, would be the feast of first fruits, uh, which would then be a grain offering waved before the Lord. We're going to bring a portion of the harvest in and sacrifice it to the Lord, believing this small portion represents a greater harvest that is yet to come, first fruits. On that Sunday, Jesus rises from the dead. The first fruits of a harvest of many who would come who would rise from the dead also. So during that time period of his death, the way he died in his sinless state, his resurrection on a Sunday morning, he fulfills three Jewish feasts. That is why the early church worshipped on Sunday in fulfillment of a Jewish feast. Now, when we get to Pentecost, Pentecost then is to be, is to be seven weeks, sometimes 749, and then the next day the Feast of Pentecost is held again, which places it on a Sunday morning. So on a Sunday morning, on this Sunday morning, uh, and these guys typically in the Middle East arose at sunrise. Uh, they were probably together typically by 7, eating together somewhere between 7 and 9 o'clock in the morning. This event occurs and the Holy Spirit uh, is poured out uh, upon them. Uh, the, uh, the Feast of Pentecost is on that day. The day the church is born, therefore, is on a Sunday morning. We worship together. We're doing this on this day because Jesus fulfilled the Feast of First Fruits, rising again on a Sunday morning. The church is born on Pentecost on a Sunday morning. Now, the reason I point all that out is because I still see uh, stuff on Facebook and articles and stuff about how the reason the church meets on Sunday is because uh, an edict by somebody in the 5th century or 4th century. That's uh, Again, we have a theological term for that. It's called baloney. It's a baloney in the Greek. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's because of these events that, uh, that we're studying here. Now, it doesn't matter what day. We, it doesn't matter what day. Paul says, I esteem all days the same. The only if we didn't have a, a facility to meet in, the only time we could meet was on a Saturday night, a Tuesday night, a Friday night. We don't care. We just get together and worship the Lord. It doesn't really matter. But the, but the reason the church has traditionally worshipped on Sunday goes all the way back to our event uh, that we're studying about here. Now, Paul mentions this idea of first fruits and Jesus' resurrection <laughs> in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, when he says, But now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That means death. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Again, that man being the second man he's referring to there uh, as Jesus Christ. Uh, again, they celebrated Pentecost for a couple of reasons. One of them uh, was because of, uh, uh, you know, again, it's, uh, uh, it's early and kind of late spring. Uh, there is a harvest uh, portion that's brought in. They're going to bring it before the Lord. And how they do that is very interesting. Uh, and I'll explain it to you in just a moment. Uh, the other reason they did it, though, uh, was because of the fact that uh, it was the anniversary date, so they believed, of the giving of, tor of the Torah, of the law. When Moses goes up on Mount Sinai, he's given the law by God. They believed, at least traditional teaching, that it was the anniversary of that. So it's kind of interesting 
that on the anniversary of the giving of the law, we have the giving of the Spirit, which replaces the law. We're no longer under the law. Uh, we're under the Spirit uh, of Christ. Now, in the ceremony itself, I know you're starting to think, I'm not sure I want to know this much about Judaism. No, this gets good, so hang on. So in the ceremony itself uh, of Pentecost, uh, the, uh, the priest, the high priest, would wave before, it was a wave offering, two loaves of bread, not matzah, the French roll type. I mean, so with yeast in them. Very different, very unusual on a Sunday morning. Our takeaway from this is that, well, that makes perfectly good sense for two reasons. Because it represents the church. The church gets born on Pentecost as the fulfillment of this offering. It's got yeast in it, which means we've all got sin in it, and that's true. The church is full of sinners. Uh, it's represented in those loaves. It's still true today. Our sins are forgiven, cleansed by Jesus Christ. We're still going to have issues and deal with it until the time we're with the Lord and we're completely glorified. So those two loaves certainly match the church, and we are the fulfillment of it. The other part is very interesting. Why two instead of one? Uh, and it's because the church is made up of two groups of, of, uh, of people, Jews and Gentiles. Someone once said that if the high priest knew that one of those loaves of bread was the Gentiles, he would have dropped it. But uh, <laughs> nonetheless, uh, we've got two loaves representing the two different groups of people that would come together in fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant that said one day one of his physical descendants uh, would be the Messiah and he would become a blessing to the entire world. Uh, and the greatest blessing there is is to know his, uh, his greater son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Uh, so those are the kind of the, the reason for their, their getting to, together. Uh, the results uh, are very interesting. There is a sound of rushing wind. There are the tongues that uh, have the appearance of fire. They're not fire. They have the appearance of fire or of flame. And, of course, we have believers uh, praising God in various languages. The wind... Uh, again, is not, well, it's not wind, it's just the sound. A literal translation would say an echoing sound as of a mighty wind born violently. Uh, some writers would say, uh, you know, that sounds a lot like the voice of God, at least the way it's described in some passages uh, in the Old Testament, such as Psalm 29, verse 3, where it says, The voice of the Lord is over the waters, the glory of the Lord thunders, the Lord is over many waters, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them also skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord makes the wilderness of uh, shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in His temple. Everyone says, glory. Uh, the voice of the Lord, very powerful. Is this the voice of the Lord? It could be. We don't really know. But it's a sound that is so loud, apparently you can hear it all over the city. Now, the upper room, at least the traditional site, whether it's literally that room, at least in location, uh, it's in the right part of the city. From there to the Temple Mount, where basically all these men would be gathering for this holy convocation because it's uh, Pentecost, uh, uh, it's about a half an hour walk. Uh, you know, if you just started walking, I'm sure you could hit. I'm sure you could hit Kailu in a half hour, no, no, no problem. I think, and uh, I'm not. Then I'll have to check it out sometime. I haven't done my experience, but uh, you can almost get get to Kailua town. So that give you a sense, a scale that there's a there's a noise here. It's so loud. Guys in Kailua are going, man, what 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 is that? What is that noise? That, that's the, that's how loud it is. Uh, and it's carrying over, over the city so that you have them now coming to investigate and find out what in the world is going on in terms of this noise. I don't know if you've ever, in your own neighborhood, maybe heard a terrible car accident, very distinct sound, or have one of your you know, wonderful uh, uh, you know, transmitters blow in an electrical line, All, also a, a thrilling sound to hear right before your lights go out. But when you hear these distinctive noise, you have a tendency to kind of rush out and see what... <clears throat> What in the world? What's going on? So that's, that's what's going on with these men that eventually gather around uh, Peter uh, and hear the gospel. Uh, the fire, uh, again, it's not fire. It's like fire. It seems to look like fire. Uh, it, also, uh, it was very often a symbol of the presence of God. 
Uh, John the Baptist promised a baptism of fire. Uh, Moses' first contact with God was of the burning bush in terms of uh, fire, what appeared to be uh, fire. And for the Jews that are waiting the promise of the Father, uh, they would mean to them, they knew that it was the Holy Spirit. Verse 3 again, uh, then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. It wasn't fire, it's like fire. And one <laughs> sat upon each of them. And we just point out that despite traditional Christian artwork uh, that's got the upper room pictured very often with the, uh, with the apostles, the 12 apostles, and they've kind of got this little fire thing over their heads. No, it was on everyone, all 120. There is no distinction. You can go back and read it in context. It never distinguishes or divides <laughs> off. What is happening here is happening to everyone, everyone in that upper room, everyone that is, uh, that, uh, is there waiting on the Holy Spirit uh, at that uh, time. The emphasis here is that what happens in Pentecost happened personally uh, to each person there. And then they were praising uh, God in tongues. Now, Luke mentions 15 different geographical locations, uh, and clearly these citizens are able to hear Peter uh, and the others when they are, quote, declaring the wonders of God in a language that they could understand. Uh, now, in verse 4, it says, and began to speak in other tongues. The word other uh, means other of another kind. In the Greek, it can mean uh, other of the same kind. Like, it's a language that they actually know because many of them may have spoken two or three or four languages. No, it's a, of another kind. Uh, they don't know the language. Uh, and uh, the word there for language is glossa, uh, where we sometimes get our word glossa, alia, it's used in that sense. So it's, it's not a language. So you've got uh, these men and women, and they're coming out, and they're speaking in a language. Other people are there, 15 different regions uh, around the Mediterranean world, and they're all hearing them, uh, uh, some of them speak in their particular language. And their remark is, how is this happening since these are Galileans? Uh, Galileans spoke with a very distinctive accent, uh, much less the fact that how in the world would they know the language that, uh, that I know? So uh, they are speaking in, the person speaking is glossa or glossaelia. It's a language, but they don't, they don't know the language. What they're saying is they're declaring the wonders of God. Uh, that's very clear. Verse 6 uh, continues, everyone heard them speak in his own language. And that's uh, dialectos or dialectos where we get our word dialect. So uh, it's a language that uh, they know. Uh, again, just to be, uh, to be very, very clear, we could, uh, we could probably have... Uh, uh, Karen's stand up and say something in, in Mandarin, and even though her parents would uh, understand, the rest of you wouldn't. I would if she said one of the three words I know, of course, but uh, other than that, I uh, would have no idea. Uh, she would know what she's saying, but we would not know. This is the reverse. The speaker doesn't know. They're just speaking another language. We call that supernatural, <laughs> a miracle. Uh, they're speaking a language they don't know. It's coming out and other people are understanding. And again, verse 11, we hear them declaring uh, the wonders of God. Now, we're going to have this uh, uh, similar occurrence, chapter 9, excuse me, chapter 10, as well as uh, chapter uh, 19. Uh, Paul teaches all on this phenomena uh, extensively to the church in Corinth, uh, where there was a lot of problems and issues uh, with the folks there. Uh, even though they seem to be uh, uh, have these uh, spiritual gifts. Uh, but in chapter four, uh, 14 of verse 1 to 5, let me read this and we'll go back and make some comments. And, and the reason I need, need to do this is because you, you get all kinds of teaching about this. You, you get teaching that says uh, from, from some of these guys over here and some of these guys over here uh, that what was going on, uh, was they were coming out and they were speaking in a language they didn't know and they were proclaiming the gospel and these people are hearing the gospel in their own language and that's how they got saved. Uh, that's not how they get saved. We, you know, we haven't gotten Peter's sermon yet. You know, uh, Peter's going to preach. He's going to preach in Aramaic. He's going to preach like he always does. Jewish guy, Jewish crowd, Jewish holiday about a Jewish Messiah. He's just going to preach to them. We'll look at that sermon next week. He preaches the gospel and that's how they get saved. There's nothing about these guys preaching the gospel. It doesn't say it there. It says they were declaring the wonders of God. Paul's going to tell us here, when a person speaks in tongues, they're not talking to men, they're talking to God. Everything is directed towards, towards God. 
Everything in a tongue is directed at God. It's worship, it's praise, it's thanksgiving. It's got nothing to do with preaching the gospel. I, I hear people, people that I love uh, say, uh, respect, praise the same. It's like, well, if a person can speak in tongues, why don't they figure out what language it is and go to that country and preach the gospel? Uh, because they can't. They don't understand what they're saying, for one thing, and they're speaking to God, not to man, and another thing, and I don't know that it's really going to help if they could even figure out what language it was and even get there, uh, if it was to stand on a street corner somewhere and, uh, and give thanks to and praise to God. I don't know that that would really help, but uh, we get all these kind of strange teachings that, uh, that come away from this. Well, listen to what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 14. He says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. But especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue, that's our subject, there it is, does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues. I know for some of us, that's a very shocking statement, but the Apostle Paul says we should eagerly desire and, and seek spiritual gifts. And in verse 5, he says, I kind of wish that all of you spoke in tongues, but, in contrast to that, even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless, indeed, he interprets that the church may receive edification. Prophecy. We say something uh, the Lord's put in our heart to another person uh, that is meant to uh, exhort, to comfort, uh, to encourage. Paul says, uh, man, I was, that's really the greater thing, you know, that we'd be able to do that one to another. In another place, he's, he's going to say, I'd rather just have you say like five intelligible things than go off in, uh, in tongues for like 30 minutes because it's not helping anybody because it only edifies you and it doesn't edify the church or another person. That's why we sometimes refer to it as a private prayer language so that when you're alone, you can pray in this language if, if you've been given this, this gift. Does everybody get this gift? Absolutely not. Paul goes through a list of the gifts. Do all prophesy? No. Do all speak in tongues? No. Uh, but if you happen to have this gift and you used it, you'd primarily use it alone you wouldn't know what you were saying. You would just know you're worshiping the Lord. Uh, and, and, and mysteriously, supernaturally, it would be building you up uh, in your own heart. Think about our study in Romans where, where Paul says that, uh, that sometimes we don't know what to pray. We've just gotten news that the death of a loved one, something tragic has happened. We don't even know, we don't even know what to pray. Plus, we're not really in the emotional state to really even figure out that we're just hurting. Paul says in those times, when you just groan, the Spirit will take that and interpret that and take it and deliver it as a praise to God. Your mind, your intellect has nothing to do with it. It's just an emotional expression. Uh, but Paul says you can trust God. God is hearing those groanings as prayer because you just can't get the words out. And there, there are times when that happens. If the Holy Spirit can take a groaning and bring it before the Lord as a prayer and thanksgiving or whatever it might be. He certainly can do it with another language that he's given you, though it does bypass your intellect. Therefore, <laughs> it becomes a problem and an issue if, if you're of the uh, mindset that, uh, no, I think I want my mind and my intellect completely engaged here in all of my prayers. Then that's awesome. You're probably never going to receive that gift. You probably never asked for it. In fact, you're saying, Right now, this whole thing kind of creeps me out, so I don't really know what to think about it. That's okay, You're, you know. Uh, that, that's okay. Uh, but, uh, but we don't jump over here and throw the baby out with the bathwater. We're just trying to see what the Scripture says. Is there a validity for it today? Yeah. And the, uh, the Scripture gives us some very, very specific uh, teaching about it. It's always just praise, worse, thanksgiving. It's declaring to God, not to men, uh, the wonders and praise of God. Let me give you a, kind of an example here. <clears throat> and I've got to give you an example where, where somebody gets saved because that's a much better story <laughs> than just saying, yeah, it was somewhere, somebody spoke in tongues, somebody gave the interpretation. It was awesome. Well, it was a little better than that. John Corson is uh, helping with a church plant a number of years ago uh, up in the Lake Arrowhead area. 
Uh, and maybe because he was there, there was something going on. They needed a, a bigger room than the little place they were using. So when those occasions would arise, uh, there were hotels in the area. They, they would rent basically a conference room, you know, ballroom type of thing. They would handle a few more people. And so they had done, done that. They were going to have a special Sunday night service. As long as they're paying the rent on the thing, we'll have a little afterglow. Spend some time worshiping the Lord. Uh, and uh, in that setting with believers... Uh, they'll pray for people if anyone wants to receive any spiritual gifts, everybody wants to be prayed for and so forth. Let's have an extended time worshiping the Lord. So uh, they, uh, they were doing that. Uh, the, the hitch, though, is that when you rented the room, there was a bar in the back. Uh, and even though it was for church, we're not going to really be using the bar. You still, because of a union regulation, you had to pay for the bartender. So there's, there's a guy standing behind the bar like this the whole time, watching the whole thing going on. The evening service, he's there now for the afterglow. Well, a guy uh, gets up. Uh, they're praying, they're worshiping, and a guy goes off in, in a, another language and, and kind of goes on for a few minutes in another language that he doesn't know. And uh, John waits, as he should, and no one has the interpretation. That guy doesn't have the interpretation. So according to the Apostle Paul, that's it. He says, in a meeting, at most three. <laughs> so when you're in one of those meetings with like 500 people speaking in tongues, I went, that's not exactly biblical. Uh, three, at the most, if there's an interpretation. No interpretation. So John basically said, well, apparently there's no one here with that particular gift. Uh, this brother doesn't have the uh, interpretation to that language that he spoke, that none of us know <laughs> what he said. Uh, we'll just assume it was uh, praise and worship to God. But we won't be continuing anyone else in that gift because there's no one. And so let's just go on. They went on and had a great time worshiping the Lord. And, you know, people gave people, you know, scripture they read and so forth. It was, you know, a wonderful time of worship. The bartender. Remember the bartender? <coughs> so the bartender comes up afterwards and says, I'm just standing in the back over there. And I'm wondering why the young men said what he did in Farsi. Because I'm Iranian. And I, uh, he's, and he went and he says he was praising and he was worshiping God. I'm assuming the God of the Bible that you worship and blah, 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 blah. Is he Iranian? I, I'd like to meet him. Yes, I would like you to meet him. Come right over here. But, uh, and then he has to explain to him, but he doesn't actually know what he said. This is just a supernatural thing that God did and explains what I've been explaining to you. And the bartender gets saved. That's, why, that's a better story, isn't it, when somebody is saved in the end? And I can tell you other stories like that. So th this is a gift that still happens today. It's meant primarily to be a private prayer language. Uh, it could be, uh, you, know, you know, language is a mystifying thing. You know, it's really uh, just sounds, and we agree to what those sounds mean. You know, we could say, ooh, ooh, and uh, oh. When I say ooh, ooh, that means, yeah, we want to go, and uh, uh, we don't want to go. And if I say, aha, uh -huh, that means zipping. So I say, aha, uh -huh, you say, uh, oh, okay, we're not going to zip it. It's just an agreement. It sounds with an agreement. Sometimes we can hear someone uh, maybe pray in another language, and we're going, that's no language. Well, <laughs> I've been to places where, in my vicinity, I can see the hills where there's 56 different languages that exist. There's places in India, every time you cross the hill, they got another dialect or another language. Lots of languages out there. Uh, and God still does this <coughs> because there's the abuse. We don't want to jump over here and deny a, a biblical truth. That, that's that's our, our whole point here. Uh, God still does work uh, in this way. Uh, and so there were three phenomena. There were what appeared to be like an image of, uh, of fire over each of their heads, which they knew to them and meant the presence of God was over them, not as a crowd, but everyone individually. This is at Pentecost. There is a huge sound, not a wind, but a sound like a violent wind that attracts a huge crowd that's going to uh, give opportunity for, for Peter to preach the gospel. Uh, before that happens, they hear other people speaking in a language that they understand themselves, despite of what part of the, uh, of the Roman world that they, uh, they have come from for the Feast of Pentecost, and they understand they're declaring the praises and the wonders of God. But the apostles and the disciples themselves have no idea what they're saying, uh, but Paul would give further teaching on it to say they're always speaking to God. It's for a personal edification 
And there are going to be those rare occasions where in a set meeting where, and we're saying, hey, go for it. This is okay. It's just us. Nobody's going to freak out, flip out, uh, think any less of you. Uh, if you got it, go for it. And, uh, and if somebody's got the gift to uh, interpret, uh, then we'll all be edified and went, man, that was awesome, cool what God did, and uh, he's moving among us tonight, uh, or whatever it might be. Those things are still going on. They're still happening. Our problem is the abuse, and we're going to throw the whole thing out. Uh, we're trying to stick with the Bible. The reaction of the crowd may be your reaction right now, bewilderment and amaze. <laughs> Verse 12, some of them were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? Uh, and of course, uh, the reaction of the crowd was, uh, uh, was twofold. Uh, you've got those were the cynics, the critics uh, that said uh, they've had too much wine or too much new wine, uh, some translations. And Peter's going to respond to that by saying, hey, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. It's the third hour. It's a holy convocation. It's Jews. Uh, we don't eat or drink uh, before 9. Uh, so it's kind of a ridiculous statement uh, given the context that it's given in uh, and besides that, uh, I've never heard a drunk person be able to speak clearly in another language. They usually can't speak clearly in their own language, <laughs> much less somebody else's. So it's kind of a, a crazy statement. Uh, but notice the other people, they said, we want to know. We want to understand this. Uh, we're, uh, we recognize that something supernatural is taking place. Uh, is, uh, can anyone inform us as to what's going on? G. Campbell Morgan said, the spirit-filled church always presents to the world supernatural phenomena, producing amazement, perplexity, and criticism. And, uh, and again, G. Campbell Morgan is over in this camp, uh, and, uh, and yet he's saying the church should be a church uh, that has a supernatural phenomena taking place that should produce amazement. It will produce perplexity. And we'll always be criticized. Uh, but as we're going to see, the important thing that anytime something happens in the church that is of a supernatural phenomena, we must always, like Peter did, give a scriptural context. So they're going, what in the world is going on? Uh, and Peter is going to be able to tell them right here in verses 14 to 18, the scriptural context for the experience. But Peter, standing up with the eleven raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these men, uh, for these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, said God, uh, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. They say, what is going on? And Peter gives a scriptural context for what's taking place. Uh, and, uh, and certainly we need to be able to do the same. He does it by, he says, this was what was spoken of by the prophet uh, uh, Joel. Uh, Peter didn't preach to them in tongues. He's just speaking to them. Uh, in explaining what has uh, transpired. Verse 14, let me explain this uh, to you. Uh, and he said, we are at this point in the last days. Joel said, these kinds of things would occur in the last days, and we're in the last days. So well, I thought we were in the last days. We are. We're in the last of the last of the last days. These guys <laughs> were in the beginning. It begins, really, with the ascension of Jesus Christ, it ends when Jesus Christ returns back to planet Earth, Revelation uh, 19. We're in those last days. Also, I find it interesting that these guys really lived their lives that way. Uh, none of them ever predicted Jesus would come back in their lifetime. None of them ever predicted that, but they all lived that way. They all lived that way. They believed he could come at any time. There was always a sense of urgency about their life, uh, about the gospel, uh, about uh, uh, out there doing what they could to... Uh, tell others about the love of Christ and so forth. Uh, they believed they were in the last days. Did they necessarily predict or think Jesus was coming in their lifetime? No, but they still lived that way. Uh, and a great example for us, and that's the way the church has always lived, uh, that God's used. But he says, let me explain what's, uh, what's going on. We're living in the last days, uh, and in the last days, these kinds of things 
were supposed to occur. So he gives a scriptural context for things, and so should we. We should always do the same. Uh, the reason that we pray for the sick is because the Bible says to pray for the sick. The reason we lay hands on people sometimes, we pray for them, because we see it in the book of Acts, and we have teaching on it uh, in the epistles. The reason we go down and we baptize people in the water is because Jesus commanded us to do it, and we have clear teaching on it in the scripture. Why are you guys down here dunking those people in the water? Let me tell you why. We have a scriptural context for why we're doing what we're, uh, we're doing. Uh, to partake in the Lord's table. Why are you breaking the matzah and the bread that way? And why are you passing those little cups around? Well, let me give you the scriptural context for what we're, we're doing. And then you've got the slain in the spirit. What's the scriptural context for that? Oh, there's not any. There is no scriptural context. The only people that get slain in the spirit in the New Testament are two guys that get killed. I'm not really sure what that, that's, that's what they're alluding to. Uh, the idea of holy laughter and uh, running around and, uh, and screaming and barking like dogs and saying that you, because you're filled with the Holy Spirit. What's the scriptural context? There's not a scriptural context. And, and that's part of the problem on this side. Everything becomes emotion, experience based, and that's a problem. Experience can never become the criteria for truth. Uh, if it does, we got to apologize to the Mormons. Because the Mormons say they have the truth in the Book of Mormon. And they say, you want to find out? Read it. You'll have a burning in your chest or in your bosom. It could be because of the Zippy's chili. I'm just, I don't know. I don't know what it is. But, uh, it, you know, I get a burning in my bosom from uh, a lot of things, but I've never read the Book of Mormons. But if experience is the criteria for truth, they have every reason to say that. And we cannot refute that. Experience can never be the criteria for truth. Uh, it's always got to be uh, God's word. So that anytime there is a spiritual phenomena or experience that takes place, there's always got to be a scriptural context. This is why we do what we do. <laughs> there was a, a while ago, and uh, you probably don't hear all these stories, but uh, there was a while ago, there was a, a guy, a guy in, in the sanctuary uh, would find little, little, little gold chips, and he'd tell people, look around for the little gold chips on the ground, and they'd find these little plastic glitter deals, and they would go, and then and they'd kind of, you know, it's a sign. God's going to rain gold down on us. We're going to be rich. We're going to be, you know. So I find those things all the time. But it's because of the kids coming from Sunday school. They got their papers. The stuff falls over. I'm vacuuming. I never took it as a sign from God. You know, I just, kids from Sunday school. Uh, I'm not kidding you. I could go on and on with stories. There's some crazy stuff that's out there. Uh, and it's, it's taught and believed by some wonderful people sometimes. Just because it's coming from a pulpit. There is no scriptural context for what's happening. So it's very important to see uh, why we do what we do and be able to go to the scriptures for an explanation for uh, any experience that we may have. Notice also the experience, secondly, is for everyone. Verse 21, everyone who calls in the name of the Lord uh, will be saved. In Luke 11, 11, Jesus makes reference to the Holy Spirit. All we have to do is ask. Uh, if a son asks for bread, from any father among you, will you give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will you offer him a scorpion? You then, being evil compared to God, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Uh, everyone that calls uh, will, uh, will receive. Uh, this is a personal experience that they're all having. But Peter is able to bring a scriptural context to try to explain a supernatural phenomenon. How long will it go on? Well, Peter continues, of course. We've divided his little quote from Joel, but the rest of Joel continues, verse 19 to, 20, uh, to 21. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls in the name of the Lord uh, shall be saved. Uh, again, Peter is saying that this happens. We're in the last days, quoting Joel. Uh, and then he continues the quote of Joel. And what he describes is what is going to take place here on earth just before the return of Jesus Christ uh, to planet earth. Uh, again, Jesus quotes the same kind of uh, circumstances in Matthew 24. Uh, we have similar 
uh, in the book of Revelation, uh, and we've also got Isaiah talking about this uh, similar kind of, of things that take place, supernatural phenomena in the heavens. What does that mean? That means the last days, he says, have begun now, and that's why you're seeing what you're seeing. And God's spirit is for everyone and everyone who calls on the Lord. This would be a shocking statement if you're Jewish, because the Holy Spirit came on prophets, priests, and kings. So the idea that every person can have the Holy Spirit come upon them would have been a radical statement. He goes, but we're in the last days. This is different. This is Pentecost. The church is beginning. The Spirit has come. We're not under the law anymore. He's going to go on and preach the gospel. How long is this going to continue? These kind of things until Jesus comes back. Because he continues the, the rest of the quote from Joel and says that uh, there's going to be these supernatural phenomena that takes place in the heavens. And we could correlate with that Jesus teaching, uh, with uh, Joel's other prophecy, with Isaiah, the book of Revelation. This is all preceding just right before Jesus comes back to planet Earth. So much for the cessationist side that says, no, these things were for a limited time, uh, ended with the end of the apostles, not according to Peter. Uh, not according to the Peter. But these things will continue on into the future. Coming to the Spirit, uh, these things take place. Uh, the rushing wind, the tongues of fire, we don't see that again in the book of Acts. That seems to be a one-time occurrence on the day of Pentecost as that feast is fulfilled. Uh, but the believers speaking in various languages, we see it again, and then we have further teaching on it in the book of Acts. Uh, the scriptural context, they say, uh, Peter says, let me explain this to you. Uh, and says basically that this experience of the Holy Spirit uh, is for everyone uh, and then he ties the rest of the events of what is transpiring to the very end of what we call uh, the tribulation Peter, uh, period. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 24, 29, of that period, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And of course, Jesus Christ returns because the remnant of Jewish believers uh, that have placed their faith in him, call out to him, and he returns to save them from the Gentile armies that have surrounded Jerusalem to try to destroy it once again. So that's our context. And uh, my whole point is, hopefully, is that uh, uh, we would uh, desire and seek after spiritual gifts. That's what Paul says. Uh, and, uh, uh, you, you know, there, there's lots of gifts, spiritual gifts, gifts of helps, mercies, uh, giving. I mean, there's uh, several lists given in the New Testament. Uh, this is just one of them. We're not in this camp where we place this as the litmus test for uh, all other gifts. I mean, there's some churches, if you don't have this particular gift, the gift of uh, this other language that we're talking about, then uh, it's the only sign that you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. But Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you'll be my tongue speaker. No, he says, you'll be my witness. Uh, and that witness is to be a witness of his love. Uh, that uh, the ultimate sign of, uh, of the Holy Spirit is that uh, his love in our hearts that would overflow to others. Uh, the Apostle Paul, we see him baptized in the Holy Spirit, and we see no evidence of him speaking in tongues. Well, we'll get to that when he is converted on the Damascus Road. But later, Paul would say, and I speak in tongues more than you all. So apparently, that was a subsequent experience that he had later. Does that happen? Apparently, that happens as well. Uh, you've been a believer, you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and you re receive another or some other spiritual gift, which, uh, uh, trust me, if you're not desiring this gift, you're not going to get it. <laughs> uh, God doesn't work and op operate that, that way. Uh, but you have to be, be open to it. Uh, if you can groan in the Spirit, uh, you probably can pray in another language in, in the Spirit as well. Why would I want to do that? It edifies you build you up. And, uh, and I can tell you, there's times when uh, in my life when I just don't even know what to pray. Plus, uh, whatever, whatever is going on sometimes, you know, you're just too much of an emotional wreck to even try to figure it out. It's nice to have a little fallback and just, Lord, bypassing the intellect here. I'm just coming to you. See, I, I was, you know, when I came to the Lord, <clears throat> I was such a... Uh, uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm a drug addict, drug dealer. When I come to faith in Christ, it's like, I'll take anything you got, you know? And so it's like, when I'm saved and God is uh, transforming my life, I, I'm thrilled. And I hear, hear Pastor Bill teach about this. He says, 
You can have more power in your life if you call out and ask for the Holy Spirit. Oh, give, me, give me two. You know, I'm just sign, sign me up, whatever you got. You know, it's like, and if you do this, and God might give you a, a language. Is that helpful? It's helpful. Give, give me a couple of those. Oh, I'll, take it, I'll take it, whatever you got. I was just so needy. It was just, so it was just natural for me. I, I wasn't like, well, let me think about this in my intellect, whether I completely understand exactly what's transpiring here. I, I didn't care. I, I could care less. Uh, you know, it, uh, I just wanted whatever the Lord had for me because I wanted transformation. I wanted change. Uh, and the Lord's in the business of doing that. I just encourage you to be open uh, to the Lord. And as we study and continue, and we prayed a couple of times, and we're going to pray again. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit because that's what the apostles did over and over and over. Those guys needed it, and we, we needed it as well. Amen. Well, let's pray.
He's our savior. He's the one who heard our call. He's the master. Catch you in.